Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, hello, Iceland. It's, this is a beautiful place to be in the Harpa Concert Hall. And that's true. I had my first psychedelic experience when I was just 13. But now, stop for a moment and think about what that does to you. What thoughts pop up to young? What's that weird guy? Um, my first psychedelic experience was not substance-induced, and that's the important point I wanted to share with you. It was through um, a long practice of meditation and an experience in connectedness with nature. So if you think about it and realize what did you thought the first time that you heard he had the first psychedelic experience with 13, that's a lot of stigma, a lot of ideas, a lot of things that are going in your mind that we want to change. It's about creating an attitude towards these experiences, these substances, and detaching the idea that we need a pharmaceutical induction to experience them. Um, yeah. When I first was invited by Sara here to talk at this conference, I was asking, like, me? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a public uh, company. I don't have 37 years um, experience in uh, advocacy and generating studies to bring a substance to approval by the FDA, I don't know what to talk about. So I talked to my wife, and I told her, what should I talk about? And she told me, well, just tell them what you're doing. Tell them what you have been doing. And then I said, like, but this, that, enough. And I guess that's one of the topics I have to work with myself about, it's my own process without being diagnosed. There's some things I still think need to think about and to work on. Who am I? I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a medical doctor specialized in anesthesia, intensive care, emergency medicine, and now training to be a psychotherapist in the CBT School of Thought. I'm also a master's candidate in neuroscience and psychology because I love that so much, also measuring and finding out the mechanisms behind that. But it's a lot more than just that. I'm also uh, at the program committee from, for the augmented psychotherapy training for the Mind Foundation, and I'm a special advisor for Divergence Neuro. Right now, my my role in the Ovid Clinic is the CEO and medical director, as well as I'm an advisor and part of the executive board at the Mind Foundation. Just this year, we founded uh, the German Psychedelic Research and Therapy Association, which is a mere medical and psychotherapeutic association for those that are looking to define the values, the ethics, and the little rules around how to implement this in medicine. This slide, as um, recommended by Chakruna, uh, is also intended to be my disclosure slide to present, yes, I'm partly owning the clinic. Yes, I also do the trainings. And yes, I have an, uh, um, a role as an advisor somewhere. So what do we do? You can put it in two different parts, the Ovid Clinic and the Mind Foundation. The Ovid Clinic is a clinic for psychiatry, psychotherapy, and augmented psychotherapy. I resonate a lot with what Ben Sessa said before, don't call us a ketamine clinic, because it's so much more than that. We do integration-focused psychotherapy. We also do groups. And we are investigating how a ketamine protocol in a group would work like. We, at the moment, work with atypical psychedelics, uh, such as ketamine and non-pharmacological interventions using stroboscopic light, breath work, VR, and other interventions to uh, induce altered states of consciousness. Uh, and just at the beginning of the, uh, of the year, we started with uh, digital interventions and the VR-assisted integration. And this is uh, uh, something that I'm very excited about because it takes the patient right from their experience to a space that they can revisit through the VR days after. 
And we will be uh, doing studies with uh, classic psychedelics together with Beckley Cytec um, later this year. So that's the clinical part. That's the part where we see patients, where we treat them already with the tools that are available to us. And while we more or less wait for those substances that we are just hoping and expecting to become available for um, a lot of patients that are waiting for them, we're not standing still. We're still developing our protocols and we learn with every patient that we see. On the other side, the Mind Foundation is a nonprofit science and education organization funded a bit uh, more than six years ago with a small group of volunteers just giving their heart into the thing and uh, in a shared office, um, developing through the years to now having an office where we can actually, um, yeah, have, have the, the necessary support and the necessary team to, to create an impact in society. The Mind Foundation has focused in 10 programs, if you can call that focus. Um, we go, we go, um, we go to conference. Actually, that picture that you see up there, that was the last breaking convention in the UK, where I was very young at the at the time, in terms of psychedelic knowledge, and um, I was watching how how Ben Sessa would present, and I was like, wow, this this, uh, and now I'm standing just beside him on this this uh, space. So, uh, yeah, um, it's amazing. <laughs> We also do the professional training and education. The APT program is intended for um, people in the, in the medical sector, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, doctors, uh, and medical professionals of other fields, and also supporting personnel. Um, it's a two-year program that is, a, is hybrid. We have on-site training two weeks per year, and then we have online training and mentoring and supervision. Um, also online. That guy there is uh, Professor Gerd Gründer. That's uh, my colleague and my uh, clinic co-founder. He is also the one that initiated and the PI of the second largest study with psilocybin. Um, but I'll tell you more about that in a minute. The training is also experiential, legal, as I told you before, we use stroboscopic light and that can create within the right set and setting, preparing it all with um, necessary care, altered states of consciousness very similar to a psychedelic experience. I'm not going to say it's going to be the same because you have to uh, learn a little bit more or be able to let go. Um, but it has been very, very unique. Um, we also have breathwork self-experiences, and we offer a ketamine group self-experience throughout this training. We also organize conferences. This, that's why I really appreciate how uh, this has come together, because it's a lot of work, and it's just put here so beautifully. And yeah, thank you. Our conference is called Inside Conference. Uh, this year, we will do the, the third edition. We also have symposias, and we all do this conference every two years because, as I said before, it's a lot of work and we have a lot of projects. We also give uh, awards for, um, for researchers that are doing a lot of, of valuable work. The last one went to Roland Griffith, for obvious reasons. And we don't stop there. We go further. We talk to politicians. We try to, to shape the discourse around the substances. Changing the language is one very important thing that I'm going to talk about later. And that was November last year where we went and meet at the European Parliament in Brussels and talked about the way we could shape this field. And as you can see there, there's David Nutt, and this is the Open Foundation, there's the Spanish ISERS. Um, but it's not only psychedelic uh, people, so to speak, um, but also the Pain Alliance Association, um, the representatives of the European Psychiatric Association. So we are going out a bit outside of the bubble so that we, we can have a better reach because we also, this is nice, and everybody will agree that there's potential in psychedelic uh, assisted psychotherapy, but we, we need to start going also to those other conferences that are not 
only going to be gentle laughs and applause at the end of the talk, but critical questions and asking, well, you don't know nothing. You're an anesthesiologist. What do you think you can explain psychiatry to me? And yeah, stand there and explain our perspective or point of view. We also um, help students organize uh, so-called Unimind colloquium so that they do journal clubs and discuss about this in s s different universities. We have one in, Mer uh, in Australia, we have some, uh, a lot of them in Europe, and so on and so on. So this is what we do. On the, on, on the one side, we concentrate in education, policy, research, and on the other side, we are already treating patients with this uh, approach, with this idea, with these protocols, and every day we are developing and learning more and more from the patients because that's what we should also be doing. Hearing what the patients or the participants from trials have to say about this type of therapy. Sometimes that stays too short. As I said before, we have one major project at the Mind Foundation, and that is the episode study. The episode study is the second largest study, it's the first of its kind uh, since 1970 in Germany. It has been funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research um, with a little bit more of 5 million euros. It's uh, 144 patients or participants big, and it's going to be, uh, or, or is already being um, done in two different centers, the University of Charité in Berlin and the so-called Central Institut für Seelische Gesundheit in Mannheim, which is one of the most relevant, important centers for psychiatry in Germany. There is one publication about this study already out, and it's about the methodological challenges in psychedelic drug trials. One, for example, being the placebo. How do you administer placebo to something that, well, it's clearly then a placebo, at least after a couple of hours sitting there, and you have to do that control. Um, the patients will see, the participants will notice, okay, well, this is the placebo. When dealing with people that have uh, therapy-resistant depression, like in this study, you have to be very careful, careful about what implications that might have, because these um, participants that are, that are calling and uh, enrolling for these studies, some of them, um, this is the last hope they have. And how do you tell them, well, you might end up in the placebo group? In that moment, there's also the effect of the nocebo, you know, knowing that you got the placebo and you won't get the active substance, the experience. How do we manage this challenge? This is what this paper is about. It's about the yeah, novel approach, the different approach to, to this randomized multicenter um, study, which offers the opportunity to, for every single one of the participants to have an active high-dose psilocybin psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. How do we do that? We do it um, with two, pri uh, 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 two uh, endpoints and measurement points so that we allocate randomized to the patients in three different groups. The first uh, stage is one high dose of psilocybin, 25 milligrams, um, the low dose psilocybin, and then an active placebo. Nicotinamide creates a sense of flush in the body once you consume it, about 10, 10 to 15 minutes after. So we call it an active placebo because uh, some people that never have had a psychedelic experience might feel or think that that's the induction. And it works pretty well. There are people that actually have a slight psychedelic insight through, induced through that placebo. But then again, there's, there's also people that know, and then that stops. After this, we measure the, uh, the first endpoint, and then we relocate the patients in this way, where the ones that got the high dose might get another high dose or a low dose, to the secondary endpoint. Those that had a low dose get a high dose, and those that got the placebo definitely get the high dose. So this way, we create several different groups that we can then assess and see. Is, is, it, is it better if um, the 
the therapy works better when you have two high doses or one dose, how that compares to each other. And doing so, we allow every single participant to have this um, opportunity of the experience. So summing it up together, uh, you can see the implementation of psychedelics in medicine is more than just providing therapy and training therapists, which is already a lot of work. But as, um, as I was saying before, it's a, it's, it's, and a transdisciplinary approach is necessary. It's not only medicine, but it's also cultural sciences, it's prevention sciences, it's public health, it's pharmacology, it's social sciences, also criminology, um, study of religions, it's part of it, yeah? The biology, those are logic, um, botany, but also art, the impact of music, art, all of these things that we think do not belong to the psychedelic science. So what can we do today? What can we do now? What are we doing? Yeah. And I think the implementation of this will be different for each country. And I can only tell you about how we have approached this and provide maybe a inspiration on, for, for other countries to adapt or get ideas. So it's about education and attitude. Talking about terminology, learning the history. This is the psychedelic renaissance. This means that it was already dead once, uh, so let's learn from the past. The social aspects, the implications of bringing this to society, how will this change the way that we live and, as I was hearing uh, in the morning, save the world. Um, I don't think the world needs saving, but humankind might does. And let's use the available tools, yeah? Integration-focused therapy. You don't need any substance. You don't need any FDA approval for that. Ketamine augmented psychotherapy. Ketamine is an uh, is a, uh, anesthetic that has been used widely and is available, and you can use it off-label. And yeah, there are countries that are allowing compassionate use and special access programs to offer this to some people. And I'm going to deviate a little bit now because I would lo love to talk about all of that, but I think terminology is a very important topic. Why do I think it's important? I like this quote. Martin Heidegger was a, a philosopher that said, language is the house of being. In its home, man dwells. Those who think and those who create with words are the guardians of this home. Why do we call it psychedelics? Why do I call it psychedelics? Because I think in the, in the scientific approach is the m most descriptive way and neutral way to talk about it. Yeah? The um, etymology of the world word comes from these two things, psyche and delon. Yeah? Psyche being the mind or the soul. Again, I like the mind because it's less religiously uh, uh, um, used and to manifest. So what these psychedelics are doing is nothing else than manifesting the mind, making what is inside visible, yeah? giving you access to your inner, inner landscape should you have lost the connection to it. Of course, there are other, other ways to refer to it. And um, for example, you can call them entheogens, which kind of, yeah, if you take a look at where that word comes from, it's uh, like, birth giving, generating the God within. Or drug, which is a very stigmatized name, or narcotic. Uh, psychotomimetic was actually the first name the, uh, that LSD got as a category of a substance when Albert Hoffman shipped that to uh, his uh, colleagues in the US. He was saying, well, the psychiatrist should be the ones that take this psychotomimetic that mimics psychosis so that they gain more empathy with those that are uh, suffering from psychosis. He, at that point, didn't know that the psychiatrist will, uh, would find much more in their own experience and exploration than only empathy for others. Why I'm presenting this, we have to be aware and we have to be careful how we communicate. 
because that's the way we are going to be perceived. That's the way that we are going to, um, yeah, pass ideas of what to expect of these substances. And there's a lot of aspects of these substances, but the a descriptive neutral way to do, deal with that, it's, in my opinion, the best way, at least from the scientific perspective. So what else can we do? Pollination, huh? Spreading the word, talking about this, uh, this um, book. Yeah. Terminology, again, very important. When I talk about, well, well it, it, it has changed a little bit, but when I, when I started talking to my, to my friends, to my colleagues, coming out of the psychedelic closet, if you want, I would always get the same ketamine. That's that horse tranquilizer, right? <laughs> and I was like, yes, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> and then it changed. And now ketamine is being implemented, it's being used more, it's being uh, accepted a little bit more. But then there are those that say, no, no, no. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic, not a psychedelic. And I say, well, it is. As much as ecstasy is a rave uh, drug, and therefore, thank you, MAPS, it takes about 37 years to change the concepts of our minds, and I hope that we don't take that long for the next and the next and the next, but to catalyze this, they have done such an amazing work. So thank you, Rick, thank you, Ben, and everyone involved in these studies. Now, going back to how I dealt with this, this idea of, well, psychedelics, they are not, they, and ketamine is not a psychedelic, it's a dissociative, whatever, whatever. My way of dealing with that is also going back to the, the reflection of the scientific method and the rules that we gave, give ourselves to um, describe something. So can ketamine induce a psychedelic experience? That means that we want or need a measure of the psychedelic experience. And there are several questionnaires that we use in, in uh, studies to measure the amount of uh, yeah, changes in uh, perception. For example, the mystical uh, experience questionnaire with different categories as the mystical, the positive mood, uh, transcendence in time and space, and the uh, very difficult to understand ineffability the difficulty to put the experiences in words. Before this, we had this. This was uh, created by Dietrich in the 70s and talked about five different dimensions of altered states of consciousness. So they weren't talking about psychedelic states. They were just talking about states that you can um, enter in different uh, moments with or without substances. For example, you can enter uh, altered states of consciousness experiencing pain experiencing pleasure, experiencing uh, suffering. And this is how, how he um, proposed to, to define those categories. Later, this was uh, reiterated and they found out, well, I think there are 11 dimensions of altered states of consciousness. And I, I really like this, I really like this because if you see that you can, see that there's a, a lot of different ways where a psychedelic experience can take you. And not all of them are pleasant. And it's not always about them being pleasant. Yeah. So why am I uh, saying you, uh, why am I telling you this? Because when I talk to people about the psychedelic experience and the rules that we have gave each other about what is psychedelic, what is not psychedelic, you can see the, um, 11, the ASC here interpreted after, um, after testing and comparing it to different psychedelic substances. Yeah. So we see they are all a little bit different and ketamine goes uh, in the way of disembodiment a little bit more, but it is in fact able to yeah, stand the challenge against MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. So I think right now you would agree that, well, Ketamine is, uh, phenomenologically speaking, a psychedelic. Okay, but what about the measurements? What about the, the brain-derived neurotropic factor that incre is increased by the activation of the 5-HT2R receptor through serotonin-like uh, substances? 
Well, we have also evidence that ketamine can do the same, but through a different path. So there's evidence for that. Yeah, but that doesn't correlate to the activation on the DNN and the brain networks that can change. Well, if you take a look at this comparison between the areas that uh, resonate, it's not the same. Again, these substances, and I'm not saying that these substances should be considered the same, but at least they are comparable. They're all psychedelics. And I, I didn't invent this. 19, let me see, 98. They were already publishing uh, scientific papers about the psychedelic effects of ketamine in healthy volunteers. And also interesting to see that there is a relationship to a steady state plasma concentration, which we might not get with uh, intramuscular or um, intranasal application. Krupitsky, in his time, he was already mentioned by the uh, alcohol use disorder uh, trials by Ben. He also talked about the psychedelic uh, experiences um, that ketamine could induce. And this year, just at the beginning of the year, this paper came out. A unified model of ketamine dissociative and psychedelic properties. So it is both. Or at least this review came to the conclusion that if you take a look at this, you can go into a dissociative experience or a psychedelic experience, the dissociative experience having no association with better outcomes, and the psychedelic experience having association with better outcomes. Both have a simulation of neuroplasticity, and, well, embedded in a psychotherapeutic approach can have long-term benefits. So my proposal to you all is to see that, yes, Ketamine, neurobiologically speaking, is an NMDI receptor antagonist. Uh, it also modulates the AMPA receptor, opioid serotonin, and generates a thalamocortical dissociation. Thalamocortical dissociation is just a fancy word to say that the senses that you perceive don't go through the thalamus, the door to consciousness, and are perceived consciously. Yeah? So it's a dissociative and aesthetic. But according to the phenomenology, when applied in some anesthetic doses with the right mindset, setting, and preparation can lead to a psychedelic experience. So what I'm saying is that the old definition is not wrong, it's just incomplete. And integrating both aspects needs a little bit of cognitive flexibility to adapt a new terminology. And yes, ketamine is an atypical psychedelic. What was the problem back then? Why does ketamine have such a um, yeah, reputation? Um, from my perspective, I think that comes from the time and the zeitgeist that was there, a pharmacological paradigm that was investigated. If you take a look at this report, it's from the 2000s, yeah? the antidepressant effects of ketamine in depressed patients. They did a great work, they a, uh, had great results um, that led to another paper being published. Uh, this, is, this is this one, the confirmation that indeed, um, Ketamine has a uh, uh, fast acting and, well, compared to antidepressants, other SSRIs, a long lasting effect. What you see here, and you cannot realize if you don't read the paper, is that this is all based on the pharmacological effects of ketamine. So if you give ketamine, you go away, you come back when they're done, and then you send them home. Yeah, this is what we're going to, what, we are trying to change the idea that the substance will do the change. The substances rarely do the change. Otherwise, uh, in Berlin, I wouldn't have a job. And this is based on the pharmacological uh, paradigm. With the psychedelic renaissance, I would say the change of perspective started here with these two papers. And I don't know if you can realize why I just put the titles up there. I don't want to show you any, any graphs. Roland Griffith had this idea that psilocybin can occasion mystical experiences that lead to changes. Again, here, psilocybin occasioned mystical experiences are the ones that are treating the affliction, not the substance, the experience. And with this approach is what we're building on. And if this is true, then 
we have to revisit this idea of the monoamine hypothesis. The monoamine hypothesis states that there is a biological lack of serotonin in the synaptic cleft leading to affective disorders such as depression. And what we need to do, therefore, is to administer a substance that somehow increases the amounts of serotonin in the cleft, like an SSRI, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and then everything will be fine. Okay, scientific approach, we need evidence for that, right? There is no evidence about uh, this being true. There is no evidence, no study that can show you that, that there is a correlation between people suffering from depression and measurements of lower levels of serotonin in the brain. Of course, it's difficult. You, you have to do a lot of things to, to, to get the measurements of serotonin, but there is no evidence. Yeah? We're working since, um, since, the, since the introduction of Prozac in the market on, on the base of this, this hypothesis without evidence. And um, July 2022, this article came out. This is a review, a serotonin theory of depression, a systematic umbrella of the evidence. And before you go and read 60 pages, this is the important part. The main areas of serotonin research provide no consistent evidence of there being an association between serotonin and depression and no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lowered serotonin activities or concentrations. Some evidence was consistent with the possibility that long-term antidepressants use reduces serotonin concentration. Now, please don't get me wrong. I do believe that SSRIs have a place and they are, have been helping people, a lot of people, and the alternative back then was inhumane treatments like cold showers, electroshock therapy, and then it came this, uh, um, yeah, SSRIs, and I understand why we went that path. But maybe it's time to evolve. Maybe it's time to take the next step. And Milan Scheidegger proposed this idea of the transformative psychiatry, going from a substitution-based psychiatry, looking at the origin of illness, the deficiencies of the brain that are associated with a particular symptom, pharmacological substitution of uh, deficiencies, to a transformation-based psychiatry, looking at the origin of illness, yeah, a biopsychosocial process, um, yeah, transformed by access, by access in more adaptive states of consciousness, for instance, by means of psychedelic substances and stabilizing psychotherapy. So this is what we did at uh, Ovid Clinic. We gathered up all the evidence that we had about the pharmacology, the phenomenology, and the approaches that were there. And we developed something that is very similar to what we would see in a psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy trial. This on this side is John, John Hopkins' um, um, a picture. That's Mari Cosimano doing a session with psilocybin. And on this side, you see it's a little bit different because we have the syringe pump administering the substance. It's not so sexy, but uh, it works. And yeah, there he is again. I don't know what happened there. Oh, maybe I'm clicking the wrong way. Right, so uh, now to our concept. What do we do? How do we do it? What are our basic principles? We definitely use the pharmacological effects, the active rapid antidepressant effect of ketamine. Yeah? The neuroplasticity inducing effect that it can have over seven days. Yeah? But it doesn't stop there. You have to shape that neuroplastic, flexible uh, brain. And we also use the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience, having these this, uh, states that can um, really shift perception, change uh, the ideas on how you saw yourself, how you see yourself, biographical uh, content being in inspected in different perspectives, leading to change in, in your, in your whole, whole um, identity. And in the center of it is the integration-focused psychotherapy. Yeah. And to be more concrete, I'm going to show you one uh, type of protocol we have, uh, because it's not li like, oh, I want to have ketamine, and then uh, they come for a session, and then they go. Um, it's a little bit more of a commitment to go through all this protocol, and I'll try to explain why. 
because, for example, in this protocol, we have an up upfront examinations, both by a psychiatric, uh, um, by a psychiatrist and an anesthesiologist, or an other organic medicine specialist. Why do we do so? We want to uh, be sure that the the participant, the, the person looking for, for help, has the right indication and has tried different things before trying this alternative therapy. We have to be careful not to yeah, present this like everyone should have it and everyone will profit from it. Maybe some will benefit from yeah, smaller or, or, or more traditional approaches. At, le at, at least it's worth trying. Yeah. Then we go through, uh, through uh, getting to know the psychotherapist. They will be working with um, psychoeducation, what to expect, where are the limits, where are, uh, what is the intention, what is the purpose of uh, visiting these uh, psychedelic states. Now, um, then we go to a preparatory session and a session with altered states of consciousness that are induced with non-pharmacological methods, like uh, stroboscopic light. This helps the patients to get acquainted with the environment, the set and the setting we um, offer, and also build the, um, the trust with the therapist, which is central in what we do. It also helps the, the, um, the patients detach from the idea that the substance will do the change, and it's only through a substance that the brain will do something to, to be uh, less depressed, for example. And then we have a program of um, continuation of five weeks, where we, every seven days we give ketamine, and every time that we give a, a substance-induced uh, session, on the next day we do integration therapy. This therapy concept uh, lives under a psychotherapeutic roof, because I believe that psychedelic augmented psychotherapy is psychotherapy. It's been augmented, yeah, putting an augmentation uh, to it. And we have this, this, we came up with this idea of the SAND protocol. What is the SAND protocol? That's um, our goal. We want to provide in our clinic uh, serotonergic psychedelics, atypical psychedelics such as ketamine and MDMA, non-pharmacological forms of induction, and digital tools and interventions. Just the, uh, at the end of the year, we uh, partner up with a VR company uh, from Australia that is offering um, a program to anchor uh, experiences with VR after they have had it. Not while on a substance session, afterwards. And I would love to stay and chat for a long time and present a couple of cases, but we don't have that much time. But I want to present two of those cases that actually had a benefit, and we measure it, and we do the Hamilton depression score for every patient once they come to us, a follow-up after four weeks, and then a follow-up after six months. And the follow-up after six months is my favorite because that's the point that we find out if our therapy really had long-lasting effects. And just shortly take a look. Um, it was the, the beginning of the treatment. That was the end of the treatment. As you see, the Hamilton depression score at 17, you have a moderate or, or, or mild uh, depression. And you can see that, at least in these two cases that are brought, of course I would bring uh, success stories and not the other ones. But they're, they're the other ones too. This uh, therapy is not for everyone and not everybody has a long lasting change. And we need to be aware of this and we need to talk openly to our patients about this. Um, otherwise, we are giving hope where there might not be one. What I have learned after two years uh, seeing patients is that it, it is not for everyone. There's a certain kind of patient that benefits more, a certain kind of patient that needs more preparation. Um, the best way that we have find, found out to induce a psychedelic experience through ketamine is the controlled application uh, intravenously because we can really control how fast we let them go into the state and how long they stay there. But the most important thing, I think, is that it needs a personalized approach. And the protocol that you saw, that was our first approach, that was the first thing that we said, okay, this will uh, work for all, this is the one size fits all, it's not. Yeah. And we have been using this as a base and then adapting the protocol to the patient needs. 
Some patients, for example, the patients with PTSD, need a lot more of preparation, trust building, before they even can go to a non-pharmacological uh, uh, alteration of consciousness. And even if we give everything we have in the clinic, we notice that it requires additional training outside of your daily practice. And that was one of the motivations to create this augmented psychotherapy training. Um, and we created it in a way that is uh, done at university, like this outcome-based oriented education um, with, with really ideas on what you need to have as an outcome. Um, not only learn it by heart, but be able to comprehend, acknowledge, understand, support, and create new ideas around this. And this is all based, well, well not all, but uh, there's a lot of um, influence by this guy called Klaus Grave. Klaus Grave was probably the most influential psychotherapeutic, psychotherapy researcher in, in continental Europe. And he, his, his main approach was trying to go away of this traditional school of thought thinking where you have the uh, psychoanalysts doing studies about psychoanalysts analysis and then saying, well, it works. And then you have the cognitive-based uh, psychotherapists and then they do studies about uh, CBT and then they say, well, you see, it works. Uh, he wanted to see what general change mechanisms throughout the schools of thought uh, work. And he came up with these five, yeah? the therapeutic relationship, the resource activation, problem activation, clarification of meaning, mastery and coping. And I invite you, for those that are working with patients already um, one way or another, to revisit these five points and try and find them in, in your, your relationship with, with, a, with a patient. Another last point, from treatment to growth. What does that mean? Can, is this only for, for ill people, for diagnosed people? And that goes also back to well, how do we define illness. And what we do is we uh, take uh, Aaron Antonovsky's approach of salutogenesis instead of what is most commonly uh, practiced in Western medicine being the, the pathogenesis or the pathocentric approach, which focuses on seeing, okay, you come in, Ben says I said it, you have a bread, uh, broken leg, I fix leg, you go away. Um, symptoms and trying to find out how to take, get rid of the symptoms, yeah, might work, but it seems like it has, has not been working before. The dichotomy of healthy and ill, what does this mean? Can be explained as a binary model, a way of thinking of you are, are either healthy or you are diseased. Yeah. Once you tell someone that there is something wrong in their brain because they lack for whatever reason, the amounts of serotonin necessary to be healthy, you are putting this person in one of these groups. There is no coming back. You will always need to take an antidepressant. That is the idea of this dichotomy of the pathocentric approach. But we have no proof for that, luckily. And if you take a look at the, at the, at the therapy where you see that two doses of psilocybin or the ketamine protocol that we have, have presented has long lasting effects even months after any kind of substance effect can be uh, responsible for that, then we might go a little bit more in this idea of, okay, maybe this is not correct. Maybe this dichotomy, dichotomous approach is not correct. What Aaron Antonovsky proposed is um, a fluid continuum of being more healthy or being more diseased. Yeah? Me having my own topics to work in, but am I, am I deceased? Am I healthy? It's, it's um, I think, the way that we can see how this psychedelic states can also be beneficial for people that have not been diagnosed. Because I, I believe that every single one of us, some more, some less, have things to work um, on themselves. The question that Aaron Antonovsky asked was, uh, yeah, the health ease versus this ease continuum. And his question was, how can this person be helped to move forward towards greater health? And basically, that is the approach. Now, I'm going to skip that. I think that's, that's uh, um, um, very complex, but it's about the intention that you have, the intention of 
going towards something or going away from something. And I'm going, I want to leave you with this, um, this German philosopher and the, the concept of Bewusstseinskultur, the culture of consciousness, because we humans are not just aware of our subjective experiences. We are able to reflect about them. Yeah. Uh, and a good state of consciousness is defined by him, like uh, it reduces suffering, has an epistemic value, and increases the possibility to experience more good states. And for that, you need autonomous thinking, because autonomous thinking, even if we think that is the rule, it's the exception. You might probably won't be wondering already, when uh, is the next speaker coming on stage, or uh, did I bought uh, yogurt, or I'm hungry? Uh, and that's not autonomy. That's the exception again. And that comes with the intellectual honesty. I was talking to someone yesterday, and the intellectual honesty can be defined as the, the loudness of your intention to be honest to yourself. You, don't, you might not always make it, but the loudness of your intention to do it might be um, yeah, important to think about. And because it always comes too short, I just want to say, how do we see integration? Integration is a process of remembering, ordering, exploring, practicing, and sharing experiences. Yeah? This is the therapeutic strategies from a transtheoretical integration-focused psychotherapy that we use doesn't mean it's the correct one, doesn't mean it's the right one, it's the one that we propose. Um, yeah, and I'm only left thanking my, my team uh, back at home, all the people that were mentors and became friends, colleagues that became family, and all the people in the field doing this amazing work. It's not only those, it's a bunch of them, and I really appreciate the support and the invitation to be here with you today. Thank you very much.